following program is a peer-to-peer -peer advice show and does not diagnose mental health conditions. If you're seeking social services, please call or text 211 or go to 211.ca. Hello, listeners on Saga 960 AM and those listening around the world on streaming and podcast services. This is It's Not Therapy. I'm Leanna Kirster, and I am not a therapist, but I am your source for practical advice for everyday problems using my top 10 sayings for checking in with your best self. Tonight, we're talking about the wellness benefits of pets and I am very excited. I'm very happy to have the co-host of Saga 960's AM, the Urban Zoo program as my guest tonight. Bill McBain and Dr. Tiffany Reddick will join us later. But before we get to tonight's topic, which is near and dear to my heart, I wanna take a listener question. Now, this is going to result in a really off topic discussion, but I'm working through a backlog of questions. So here goes, I'm calling this listener Nani, which is a Japanese word that has many meanings, but essentially translates to what? I got this from playing the Yakuza series of games. Nani? Uh, this question was in response to my comment last week about video games. That a listener question that begat another listener question. Anyway, here it goes. A lot of times when someone is trying to defend sexual content in video games outside their social circle, they're often derided as perverts who just want to see boobs. What do you think is the best way to defend sexuality in games and spread the message these days and to whom since many people are either too Puritan to open their minds or use sexuality in games as a political tool and or clickbait to make more money? How do I handle this issue? Thanks for your question, listener I'm calling Nani. Video games tend to be an easy target for pearl clutching parents when they're not going after movies or TV shows or animated movies and TV shows. The sexuality aspect of some video games is a particular vulnerability because video games made for other cultures tend to get misunderstood by our North American sensibilities. This is especially true with games made in Japan. Now, this topic is going to get a bit raw, so content warning for discussions of sexual assault for the sensitive. Japan has completely different cultural standards on a lot of things, but in some ways it's no more notable than what Japan versus the West considers the age appropriateness of different sexual and violent imagery. You see far fewer guns in Japanese video games than you do in Western media. But sexualized content is seen as appropriate for a much younger age range. Basically, Japan loves its naughty schoolgirl content. And yeah, I'm well aware of the serious issues in Japan for women, notably teenage girls, notably getting groped on public transportation. I'm not trying to claim that Japan is remotely ideal regarding gender equality. That being said, there are still a lot of things Western critics get wrong about Japanese media symbolism, and it's rooted in our own cultural myths, specifically in this case about who's the perpetrator and who's the victim in groping and similar and worse assaults. Interestingly, some activist groups in Japan found that when girls wore shorter skirts, schoolgirls wore shorter skirts, they were groped less. Not, not at all, less. Yeah, it's that big a problem. Now, these activists believe it's because they seemed more aggressive and therefore less li more likely to fight back. Now, ironically, I've accidentally tested this myself doing cosplay. I've done a lot of cosplay pre-COVID. The absolute worst groping incident I ever personally experienced involved a cosplay that was little more than jean shorts, a t-shirt, and Ked's running shoes. Now, I compare that to when I was dressed in a purple snakeskin dominatrix-type fighting game character Specifically for people who know video games, Ivy Valentine from the Soul Calibur series. 
in that cosplay, zero problems with groping. In fact, guys asked me to beat them up. Okay, that's anecdotal, but it backs up the stuff coming out of Japan. And yeah, okay, before male listeners are like, ah, I know, I know, I know, we're going to address this on next week's show. There are double standards at play. People complain about the depiction of women, then thirst after shirtless actors like Chris Hemsworth and Jason Momoa. For those of you who don't know what thirst means, it basically means like lust after. People seem to forget that this kind of stuff is all about power. It's all about coercion and unhealthy stuff. Not about normal sexual attraction, normal healthy attraction to other people. Now, Nani, you hit the nail on the head when you referenced a Puritan sensibility. Contrary to popular opinion, consuming sexy content, even flat out pornography, doesn't correlate with more sexually aggressive or abusive behavior. Now, does that mean that some people don't have an unusually unhealthy relationship with this kind of content? No, of course not. Any activity that's interfering with your day-to-day function is by definition a problem. But there's nothing unique about sexy content in this sense. In fact, we're going to do a bit of a history lesson. Go back to the 1990s. Picture it. North America, 1990s. Two things were happening back then. The first was that the dex- the definition of sexual assault, it was broadened so that more things were included in the definition of various types of sexual assault. I'll spare you the gory details. Take my word for it. The second thing that was happening in the 1990s was the proliferation of the internet and therefore the explosion in internet porn. There's a whole song in the musical The Avenue Q. The internet is for porn. The internet is for porn. Yeah, it, it's a wonderful song. Um, I digress. Strangely, while all this is going on, more things considered sexual assault. Lots of porn. More and more and more porn. The rate of sexual assault reported since the 1990s has decreased by somewhere between 45 and 55 percent which I get it it's you know not uh not what the media narrative is right now but this is what the documentation tells us that doesn't mean that individual stories are not real don't use this to disbelieve someone these are just the statistics Again, more things were considered sexual assault, but the rate of sexual assault drops. That suggests that sexy content doesn't cause people to be, in Nani's words, perverts. Here's the problem, Nani. Logic doesn't work in this argument. The idea of sex, the word sex, makes a lot of people do and say very strange things. As a culture right now, we're going through something of a neo-Puritan phase where even kissing in the Buzz Lightyear movie is seen by some as sexual content. So these attitudes that are giving you a problem are going to take time to shift. One of my top 10 phrases is core values are more important than common interests. Just because someone shares your interest in video games doesn't mean they're going to see eye to eye with you on, well, anything. I've played my share of these Japanese video games with sexualized content, and I think parts of some of them are weird, but I, I don't find them objectionable especially when you compare them to shows like Riverdale on the CW that glossed over the statutory rape of Archie by a reimagined Miss Grundy by referring to it as a forbidden romance. 
There's a trailer out there right now for the upcoming Thor movie, Love and Thunder, that has Zeus tearing off Thor's clothes. Can you imagine if a male character did that to a female character in a movie trailer? There'd be screaming! All this points to the fact, Nani, that our culture is messed up about all this stuff. And that's why I bite the bullet and talk about my purple snakeskin dominatrix cosplay. <laughs> I know some people are going to think I'm a quote unquote slut because I did that. And you know what? I do not care. If someone's going to reject me for a costume, they're likely going to reject me for other dominant parts of my personality too. And in my opinion, this is just my opinion. That's the root of our culture's rejection of sexualized women. It's a rejection of women who want to be seen because how dare we? And my answer to that is, well, because we dare. I'll give it to you that we're temporarily losing the war regarding dominant female personalities in video games and a lot of other media because of Puritan social norms. We're in a women as victim phase that's going to take time to come out of. So to answer your original question, how do you defend sexy game content? You don't. Just play what you like and let people scream. If they're really driving you nuts, send them my way. I'm kind of aggressive. If you want to send them my way, you could have them call 289-275-9600. Have them leave a message. They can email or you can email me at liana at nottherapyshow.com or send me a tweet or Instagram at nottherapyshow, at nottherapyshow. All right, let's get to the topic for tonight. We're talking about the mental and social benefits of pets. Those who know me know that I love animals and not just cats and dogs, though I do have five cats and a dog. But growing up, I've also had rabbits and hamsters. I love exotic birds and I even love the creepy crawlies, snakes, spiders, rats. I like bats too, but most people can have them as pets. A few months ago, exactly five days before this radio show launched, my husband and I had to say goodbye to my best buddy, Momo. Momo started life as a community cat, what we used to call strays or feral cats. He had lifelong chronic health problems st stemming from his rough start in life. But everybody loved Momo. He was 21 pounds of fuzzball in love. Momo would hug complete strangers. He was a giant fluffy cat. He was something called a ragamuffin. He used to sit on the front desk at the vet because he was just so chill. Like I said, he'd hug complete strangers. He was really well known to my YouTube and Twitch followings. So when this cat's time came, people around the world felt and grieved that loss. But that was because he brought so much joy to so many people. With Momo, it was really easy to see all the benefits of having a pet, despite all the stress, work, and expenses that came with all his illness, and a lot of snot. He had an upper respiratory thing. There was cat snot. Cat snot is very sticky. I'll, I'll spare you more on cat snot. A lot of people say that pets give you unconditional love. I don't necessarily agree. I tend to like animals with special needs. You know, bring me your weirdest, jerkiest, most destructive behavior problem animals. I'll probably love them. My husband and I even had a dog with canine PTSD who was a bite risk. So I don't say that no matter what, a pet will love you. Between community cats and dogs with very issue, various issues, including anxiety issues from too many rehomings... I've learned that sometimes it takes a while to establish trust. What I believe about pets is that unlike people, animals love you for the reasons people should be loved. They love you because you're kind, you're considerate, attentive, affectionate. 
They don't care about status or profile or popularity. They only care if you're a good person. Now, I've found different types of animals teach you different things. Sometimes they teach you patience. Sometimes they teach you consequences. Yeah, don't leave your good shoes around a dog that's a chewer. I've learned a lot about boundaries from dogs. And the reality that if you want someone to stop doing something, you have to stop rewarding the bad behavior. Now, something I learned from rabbits, especially a particularly aggressive mini lop named Elvis. From him, I learned that sometimes the best approach isn't always head on. For those of you who don't know, bunnies don't necessarily like the thing you do with cats and dogs. Let them smell your hand. No, they like you to come around from the back because of where their eyes are located. So if you came at this rabbit head on, he'd go, Bruh. rabbits make that noise. They make this grunting noise when they want to scratch your hand. Yeah. Elvis was named Elvis for a reason. But then we come back to cats. For me, cats are the ultimate lesson teachers because cats are just so weird. Cats are incredibly distinct personalities and they are big personalities. People tend to ask because we have so many cats. We had nine at one point. We're down to five. And people ask, do they all get along? Well, yeah, eventually they all get along, but sometimes it takes work. Cats are really big on rituals. Every cat has different boundaries. And cats have strong opinions. Now, therapy and emotional support animals exist for a reason. And there are as many benefits to animals as there are animals and people. Some people find that needing to get up to walk the dog keeps them out of the depths of depression. There's a quote floating around that goes the more people I meet the more I like my dog and this quote has been attributed to everyone from Charles de Gaulle to Mark Twain now what we know Mark Twain said about dogs is if you pick up a starving dog and make him prosperous he will not bite you this is the principal difference between a dog and a man but Mark Twain was more of a cat person. He was really a cat person. In fact, when Mark Twain traveled, he rented cats. He rented cats as companions and then left behind enough money for these cats to be cared for for the rest of their lives. He once wrote, if man could be crossed with the cat, it would improve man, but it would deteriorate the cat. So we're talking pets tonight. And after the break, we've got Bill McCain and Dr. Tiffany Rennick from Saga 960 AM's Urban Zoo to talk to us about the joys of pets and the mental health challenges our pets can have. So stay tuned after the break on It's Not Therapy. The following program is a peer-to-peer advice show and does not diagnose mental health conditions. If you're seeking social services, please call or text 211 or go to 211.ca. We're back on It's Not Therapy. I am still Leanna Kersner. I am still not a therapist. And before we get to the interview this week, I want to give you a few more historical animal lovers. I love animals. We're talking about pets tonight and the wellness benefits of pets, the social benefits of pets. So here goes. Abraham Lincoln was the first president to bring a cat to the White House. He left the family dog behind, but brought cats. There's a story that he once fed a tabby cat from a gold fork at a state dinner. Ernest Hemingway was a particular fan of six toad cats. The Hemingway estate is currently home to around 60 polydactyl cats. That's what they call cats with with more toes than normal. Freddie Mercury had a home in London where each of his cats had their own bedroom. And when he was out on tour... He arranged phone calls to his cat kids. Florence Nightingale is quoted as saying, cats possess more sympathy and feelings than human beings. Florence Nightingale had 60 cats over her lifetime, as many as 17 at a time. Many of her famous letters have paw prints on them from cats walking over the fresh ink. 
Now, of course, history's greatest animal lover may have been Betty White. And Betty White is a shining example of how a love of animals transfers into an understanding of people. Betty White broke down racial barriers. She was a friend to the LGBTQ plus community. And Betty White was, in general, a complete badass her entire life. Betty White was a woman constantly ahead of her time. She knew how to truly love, and so she was beloved. But you don't have to be a famous person to love animals, nor do you have to be a famous person to get the benefits associated with having a furry friend or family member. And now it's time for the interview on It's Not Therapy. This is a very special one. I'm very excited about this. We have two guests. On the program today, we have Bill McBain and Tiffany Rennick, Dr. Tiffany Rennick from Urban Zoo, the Urban Zoo program, Tuesdays at 3 p.m. on Saga 960. And we are talking the mental health benefits of pets today. So, Tiffany, Mm -hmm. you're our expert on pets. And I'm sure in your practice, I mean, we just got back the ashes from one of our kitties today. Mm -hmm. And he happened to pass five days before I launched this show. That was tough, but it was this sort of transcendental experience where uh, the, the, the pain of the loss is always made up for a thousand times by what pets give. And a lot of people are worried about, you know, that, that intense emotional commitment. And yet, you know, you're sort of renting them. You only get so much time with them. So what are the overall emotional benefits of having a a furry or scaly or feathery friend in your life? Well, I think if you talk to anybody who's ever had a pet, they could list off a million reasons why pets are, are such a great benefit. But I think when I really look at it, I look at, you know, in our relationships with people, people come with a lot of baggage. We've got our own stuff that messes up relationships and they get messy and animals come into relationship with us in a very pure, non-judgmental, they just love you because you're there. And it doesn't matter if you're having a good hair day or a bad hair day, if you're, you know, overeating today, if something bad happened at work, it doesn't matter what's going on in your life. That animal will always be there and just wants to love you. And I think that is something that people really connect with, because I think all of us are searching for connection in life. And at various levels, we struggle sometimes with our own relationships with humans. And like I said, they can be messy and they can be difficult and people can hurt you. And we carry that around with us. And animals just give, I think, one of the purest forms of love and connection that we can find on this planet. Bill, Bill, you come from the political world and yet you do a show about animals. So what, what's your take on this as, as, as the layman of the team? What, you know, what makes you passionate well, about this topic? Layman of the team and creator of the show. Uh, actually, it's interesting. The very first show we did, uh, Tiffany and I, was about this very topic. It was about pet loss. Uh, when I began the show, I had just lost our dog of 14 years. And it seemed maybe a risky topic for the very first show in a series. But I, I think... To, to this date, I think for both Tiffany and I, it's one of our favorite shows. Um, and we did, we had a minister on as well uh, uh, with us. And uh, Tiffany and I talked to, from her experience in, in the, uh, in the clinic with, uh, with her practice. And, and I talked about my experiences with, with this dog. Um, but I've always been interested in animals. I grew up with it. Uh, I blame my father for that uh, quite happily. Um, I, you know, worked on a farm when I was a boy, uh, I've spent much of my, excuse me, professional career in, in various, uh, gigs in Northern Ontario and out in the world. And it just means a great deal to me. And I've, I've, uh, it, it's a part of my life that makes me happier. And it's been a joy to talk about animals and the environment, which I think is and particularly this point in our history is, is critical that we understand our relationship with with the, with the wild and with our fellow creatures much better than, than, uh, than we have to date. 
Now, Tiffany mentioned unconditional love, and and I have a Chinese crested powder puff dog. I, <laughs> I'm getting looks. Everybody's like, oh, <laughs> right. Uh, so my next question for Dr. Tiffany is about matching an appropriate pet to a person, because this this poor little doggy, his name's Loki. Be very careful what you name your pets. He is the dog of mischief, but he was a rehome. And we've had to deal with food aggression, separation anxiety, all that stuff. We're old hats with this. So we were set up to do this, but it can be heartbreaking when it doesn't when it doesn't work that way, right? There are all these shows dedicated to, you know, Dog Impossible and things like that. So what is your advice for selecting the a good fit, both in terms of breeder versus uh, rescue community, you know, pet store animal, and also what kind of pet and what breed? So I think the most important thing is looking at your lifestyle. So, you know, an example would be if you are a person who works 12 hour shifts, four or five days a week, you live in a one bedroom, 600 square foot condo, a St. Bernard is not a good choice for you. Um, so looking at your lifestyle, what, what time do you have to commit to an animal? Because even, um, you know, getting some reptiles and some of the birds, people don't always realize how social they are. And our job is not just to feed them and walk them or provide a safe place for them. But most animals do have psychological, social, emotional needs that they have to meet. Um, so just being really honest, we all have our grand ambitions. And then there's the reality that we work within. So being honest, how much time do I have? Am I going to walk a dog? when it's minus 40 or it's pouring rain, or am I going to be like, no, I'm not going to do that. And then your lab is eating the leg of your couch. Um, so just be first is that realistic look at what my lifestyle looks like. And, you know, I, for myself right now, I, I have two active kids. They're in multiple sports. I have a busy professional life. And I've just decided for me right now, a dog, as much as I want one, is just not a good option because my ability to be home and give that dog what it needs socially and emotionally, it's just not realistic at this point. Um, but things like smaller pets, some of the small mammals, some of the lep um, like lizards and stuff, sometimes those might be a little bit better of a choice. If you have a very busy lifestyle, you're not home a lot. You don't want to have to walk a dog. You don't want to have that need to be there immediately, but you also have to think about going away on vacation. What am I going to do with that pet when I'm on vacation? So just thinking those things through of what your whole lifestyle looks like. And then once you've got that, then do your research research the breeds on the urban zoo every week bill and i talk about uh either a yep. breed or a species and we highlight a lot of stuff and so there's lots of shows that you can listen to um but do your research that is the most important thing the biggest um i guess you could say pet fails that we encounter are generally avoidable because it was more a case of not knowing what you were getting into than it truly not being fixable. And so just doing that research. And then when you're going out to look at where you're getting things from, it's also research. Research your breeder, research the rescue that you're going to be aware there's a it's a different ball game buying a puppy at eight weeks and training them in your home than by you know, getting a three or four year old dog from a rescue, like what you said, you, they've come with baggage, they've got some issues. And the other thing to recognize is a lot of people, when they get a dog or a cat or something from a rescue that does have issues, um, they often don't seek appropriate help right away. And there are a lot of amazing resources out there for people. So there's really good trainers. Your vets are a great source of information for where you can get help if you do end up with one of the, those more challenging pets, there's often a lot of options. So Bill and I harp on this, I think, on our show. Research, research, Absolutely. research, research. Because there is no right answer. I might look at someone else's lifestyle and think, you're crazy for having their pet, that pet with what your lifestyle is. But it works for them. Um, so it's really know and be realistic in your expectations of what you can actually commit to a pet 
and then do your research into the energy level. I mean, uh, a Vishla or a Weimaraner is a totally different ball game. They are just dogs on crack sometimes and they need a high paced life. Uh, you know, I've got one owner and he does 12K every day. That's perfect dog <laughs> for him. That dog runs itself into the ground and then sleeps when it's home. Yeah, we, we had a border collie. Yeah, and we yeah. think you can't leash walk those dogs. You They need to be able to roam. And I have more I want to talk to with Bill and Dr. Tiffany from Urban Zoo on Saga 960 AM, but we have to go to a break. So just hang on. And when we come back, more about you and your happy pets. It's not therapy. The following program is a peer-to-peer -peer advice show and does not diagnose mental health conditions. If you're seeking social services, please call or text 211 or go to 211.ca. We're back on It's Not Therapy. I am still Leanna Kersner. I am still not a therapist. And we are still talking to Bill McBain and Dr. Tiffany Rennick from Saga 960's The Urban Zoo. You can catch The Urban Zoo Tuesdays at 3 p.m. And before the break, we were talking about responsibly selecting and looking after a dog. And Bill did not get a chance to have comments about that. So we're back with Bill. You know, it takes a... It takes a, a neighborhood or a village to raise a child and a dog, and uh, it's important. And I and I think that's the other thing. When you have a young dog in particular, they're very much like children. <laughs> they they go through the, the same phases yep. uh, that we do, and they have the same. And this is a little hard for people to get their head around. Their emotional software and capacities are the same as ours. Mm -hmm. They feel what we what we feel essentially in that range of emotions um and we in fact one of the best interviews we've had i think on our show was with a uh, a, a pet uh, psychologist just a wonderful uh, a very grounded uh, sense of getting a sense of who your pet was and people have to realize when they take that on they're taking on the same experience of raising a child and uh, both the, the emotions and the commitment that that animal feels to you and your family, uh, uh, they are, you need to feel with them because that's who they are. They're becoming a real part of your family in every sense of the word. And just be comfortable with that and let it happen. But that means you have the frustration of the teenage, teenage years and the equivalent of the terrible twos and all mm -hmm. the rest. That's just normal, healthy development. And at the end of the day, you get a wonderful adult dog. Yeah, you predicted my next question because, I mean, this is a show about, you know, mental wellness, emotional wellness, and you mentioned a pet psychologist. We've had, yes. uh, we took a dog who had canine PTSD. We have a cat yep. that needed a, a a bridge cat, as we discovered the cat, <laughs> as cats apparently do have forms of um learning disabilities and developmental things. And this was all a real odyssey. Obviously we're odd cat people. We're odd dog people, right? We like the ones that come with challenges, but what, what do you look for in terms of mental health of animals? I'm sure you've gotten a lot of questions about separation anxiety post COVID, uh, too much attachment, not enough attachment. Um, I don't like saying behavioral issues because that makes it sound like, you know, the problem's the pet. It often isn't right, Tiffany. It often is kind of how we teach them to encounter and engage in the world around them. And so, yes, one of the challenges that we've seen post COVID is a lot of people got pets when they were at home and they didn't prepare their pets for what life was going to be like when everyone goes back to work. Mm -hmm. And, and that was exactly what Dr. Denenberg was speaking on uh, when he yep. was on our show and he did an excellent talk on it. And so we do see anxiety comes in many forms. And so I think it's important, especially if you're getting a puppy, so you're starting with a blank canvas, really exposing that pet to as much as they possibly can, because that first couple of months is their most formable stage where a lot of, um, 
that can be where a lot of anxieties develop if they don't get socialized well, if they don't get exposed to walking down the street with things that make noise. And that's one thing even looking for in a breeder, the really, really good breeders actually do desensitization with their puppies mm -hmm. from only a few weeks of age. And so they, some of them actually have recorded sounds that they go through one breeder uh, that we've also interviewed on the show. She takes kids toys. So, you know, those uh, sensory mats that babies go on and she puts them in for the puppies. And so they'll be walking and all of a sudden lights and music will go on and they're, Oh, what's this? And then, so she'll put stuff like that in their playpen with them so that they become used to these random sounds and movements and lights. And so they don't get scared by those things. Um, so anxiety can present in many ways, the dog that just won't lay down when people are gone. So it doesn't have to be the dog eating the couch or ripping things apart, but the dog is just kind of pacing the whole day while you're gone. And a lot of the behaviorists will actually recommend getting a camera and putting it up in your, I mean, there's so many Wi-Fi ones that you can watch on your phone now um, that you can actually watch what your pet is doing when you're away. And that can really help them then work with you to figure out how to help that pet. Um, we can see it in uh, attachment to one particular person in the family. Uh, so they've picked their person and everybody else is fine when their person is there, but when their person goes, they don't care about everybody else. Um, yeah. So we can see a lot of mental health issues in pets. And there's, again, there's a lot of resources that we have available to help try to work through those and help those pets have a good quality of life. And that's really what we're looking for. I mean, we can't make them someone they're not, but we mm -hmm. can try to do our best to ensure that it's having minimal impact on their quality of life. So Bill, I have a question for you as somebody who had a longtime dog owner and probably dealt with some uh, high conflict personalities, shall we say? Uh, have you ever had a thing where you thought somebody was great, your dog didn't like them? And you second yes, oh, guess yeah. that person. Did you do the same thing I do? If my pets don't like you, I'm not sure we can be buds. I listen, I, I have great faith in dogs ability, certainly my dog's ability to make judgments about people. Uh, the people that my, he was the most comfortable with and really loved and obviously loved were people I thought a great deal of for the most part. I was always impressed by his, his judgment he was such a, a, an empathetic family member. He was always so aware of us. Uh, and he was a very generous guy with his time. He, he, he would go amongst the three of us I, and spend equitable time. And if one of us was having, you know, a tougher time because of a physical illness or a bit down or whatever, he was there. He was there all the time uh, and a remarkable guy. And yeah, I trusted his judgment. He was a pretty easygoing guy. Tiffany, Tiffany knew him well. Tiffany was his vet. And he was a pretty easygoing guy. And uh, uh, he liked people. He was, one of the, he was the only pet I ever had who liked going to the vet. So um, that was, uh, that's how easygoing he was. Until he got to the needles. He was a little rough on that. But he was good with everything else. He was always yeah. a good boy. Yeah. He oh. was a good boy. We have been talking to Bill McBain and Dr. Tiffany Rannick of the Urban Zoo on Saga 960 AM Tuesdays at 3 p.m. Bill, Tiffany, thanks so much. Um, last question. What are your what are both of your advice when you do lose a pet? How do you heal and move on from that experience? Bill, you can start. Well, first of all, uh, you mentioned right off the bat, uh, you honor what, what that pet was to you and your family and you, and you hold on to those memories. The loss is every bit as profound for, for many people as it is for the loss of a family member or a favorite human being. Uh, and, and, and don't try and minimize it. A lot of people say, well, it was only a dog, da, 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 da. But in their hearts, they know that's not the case. That, that being meant a great deal to them. And just acknowledge that and, and feel the grief for a while. Over time, you know, you're sad about the loss of your animal, uh, but they have short lifespans. We know that going in and we also know how wonderful they are. And one of the things that we've said on the show is that, you know, the candle that, that burns twice as bright lasts half as long and you honor that life uh, and, and what uh, he or she meant to you. And yes, you feel their loss, but you know, you put them in context of your life and, and how important they were and you hold them there. 
uh, and you, you get on with your, with your life. And I think that's healthy. Uh, I think it's a very respectful way to look at the loss of a pet or a human. Uh, and I wouldn't necessarily uh, look at them differently other, although the funeral costs are a lot lower, um, but, uh, but, you know, uh, but still uh, honor that life and what it meant to you. I guess for me, um, I, I often see the other side of it mm -hmm. as um, the medical professional who is there often at the end. And uh, the two things I see are mostly one, but the biggest thing I see is a lot of guilt because many pets, and I would say the majority of pets, are euthanized because their health has declined and we have to make that call. It's a very small percentage that die nice and peacefully in their sleep and you find them in the morning, which is what everybody wants to happen, but it very rarely does. And so people struggle a lot with guilt because you are choosing the moment. And what I often tell people is, while it is a very difficult decision, it is the greatest gift and that final act of love that you are giving your pet because you've spent their life doing everything you can to give them a good quality of life, to care for them. And we have these beings in our care and they can't make a decision about how their life is going to end. Um, we've also taken them out of their natural environment where predation mm -hmm. and all these other things would not allow them to suffer long periods of time. And so it is that final act of love. And I try to encourage people to recognize that, that it is hard and I will never try to tell you it's an easy to de decision, but you are doing something incredibly kind. You are making a huge sacrifice of yourself because this is not something you want. You're not doing it because you're giving up on, on them. You're doing it because you know, it's what's best for them and you're allowing them to have an end that is peaceful. Um, and so I think carrying that away from a euthanasia experience is helpful for people. And then like Bill said, I think our society doesn't do a great job with grief. We try to push it down. We try to run away from it. If I don't think about it, it's not going to hurt. It hurts. Mm -hmm. It just hurts. Sure it does. Losing mm -hmm. anybody mm -hmm. hurts. And just allowing yourself to be in that space. It's okay to hurt. Mm -hmm. And I often, mm -hmm. in my own experiences, not even just relating to animals, but family members that I've lost, I found that walking through that grief actually healing takes place faster and not that we want it to be fast, but I think the wholeness that we are all searching for after we've lost someone comes in allowing ourselves to remember mm -hmm. in allowing ourselves to feel in allowing ourselves to enjoy those moments. And I think, you know, one day that memory that makes you cry, there's going to be one day when you, that memory comes to mind and it's going to bring a smile to your face and it's going to bring warmth to your heart because the experiences that we have with our pets are deeply profound mm -hmm. and they are, they are deeply moving and they touch mm -hmm. us. Um, and so just don't be afraid to just let yourself feel it. You've got to walk through that grief to find the peace on the other side. I think that's one of the greatest lessons animals can teach us because people feel the ability to feel their feelings with animals in a way they may not around people. I'd love to talk to you guys forever, but we have to go to break. Bill, Dr. Tiffany, thanks so much. The Urban Zoo, Tuesdays at 3 p.m. on Saga 960 AM. After the break, we're going to talk more about our furry friends and wellness. It's not therapy. The following program is a peer-to-peer -peer advice show and does not diagnose mental health conditions. If you're seeking social services, please call or text 211 or go to 211.ca. We are back on the closing minutes of It's Not Therapy. I'm still Leanna Kersner. I'm still not a therapist. And we didn't get to many of your questions this week because we had an extra long interview. But I want to touch on something Bill said about the range of emotions of pets. Uh, and that may help some of the people that submitted questions regarding reading social cues, making friends, navigating situations, how to be less lonely, lots of stuff. So let's try to get people some practical advice for everyday problems. Animals are incredible socializers. 
for a lot of reasons, you may not want or can't own a pet right now. But you can still volunteer at a local rescue center, offer to pet sit for your friends, just visit people who have pets if you want to get those socialization benefits. Visit, visit your friends too. Like, don't just go there to play with the pet. You can even support your local zoo or wildlife rescue. Of course, there's all the animal videos on the internet as well. A friend of mine even sent me a picture from her doorbell camera yesterday of a bear visiting her garbage cans. Pro tip, bears aren't for petting. Don't put your arm around a bear. <laughs> okay. For me, the greatest joy of pets, or one of the, I can't pick one, but one of the greatest joys of pets is that they teach us to take ourselves less seriously. I mean, how do you take things seriously when an animal's putting their butt in your face? But they also teach us, as Bill and Dr. Tiffany said, to feel our feelings. Another one of our cats, Link, the, the one I mentioned who has the uh, learning challenges, learning disabilities, developmental disabilities. Linky had to have a mask removed from his mouth this week. So it's, it's been a week. It was the same roller coaster as a human being. I have to find out if it's cancer. Happy when it's not cancer. We've, we've had quite a few cats die of cancer. But then there's all the surgery prep. And Link, extra challenging with him. He gets overwhelmed. He gets stressed. It's a whole thing. And yes, you might be wondering, is Link named after the video game character from the Nintendo series Legends of Zelda? Yes, he is. <laughs> I also have a cat named Zelda and a cat named Midna. The Midna as in the Twilight Princess Zelda game. And yeah, they're like their characters. Midna is the embodiment of, I would have helped you if you were nice. And Zelda, Zelda is incredibly smart. Zelda shows up on my Twitch streams a lot and helps play games. Zelda is associated with the Triforce of Wisdom. You know, gamers out there know that Link is associated with the Triforce of Courage, not Power. Power character is actually the bad guy. So no, people ask, what, do you have a Ganondorf? No, why would I name a cat or dog after the bad guy? But getting back to Link, because of his unique challenges, he does have to be pretty brave since the world is so confusing to him. It's a constant reminder that there's good and innocence in the world. And that's really helpful when you spend a lot of time interacting on people who are in a bad mood, especially on social media. That's a good segue into next week's topic. Next week, we're going to be talking men's mental health and how to find resources in your area. I know there are going to be a lot of questions about that, so get them in early. If you want to leave a message, 289-275-9600, or you can email me, liana at nottherapyshow.com, L-I-A-N as in Nancy A, at nottherapyshow.com, or at nottherapy on Twitter and Instagram. Give me a follow. Thanks for listening this week. Uh, until then, your crazy is only a problem if it's hurting you. Till next time. <laughs>